happens to the semiconductor supply chain if China invades Taiwan? John Ferguson is Chief Executive Officer of TBM Consulting Group. Hi, John. Hi, Bob. How are you doing today? Good. Thank you for being with me today. John, summarize for me the role of Taiwan today in global semiconductor production. Sure. Well, Taiwan is far and away the leading global provider of semiconductors. There's different ways to, to calculate that I've seen, but um, kind of the accepted way is they provide about 65% of the chips used in the world and about 90% of the advanced chips. And if you compare that to something like oil, where we look at OPEC or Saudi Arabia as a dominant producer, Saudi Arabia, I think, sits at around 11 or 12 percent of oil, and OPEC accounts for about 40 percent. So when you think about Taiwan and semiconductors being 65 percent, it's massively more important in this space. Wow. Um, and, and then in particular, when you look at the most advanced chips, Taiwan Semiconductor Corporation, which is kind of the largest dominant firm in Taiwan, is one of only two companies, along with Samsung, that has the licenses of the proprietary proprietary technology to produce the most advanced chips. So they're very important. How do we get to this state of affairs in the first place where we kind of allow this to happen? You know, I think it, it comes to where the technology was developed and where the investment was made. I think that over the last 30 years, companies have in various industries have chased the lowest cost of labor in various things and, have, and done a lot of outsourcing and manufacturing in, in that part of the world. And um, it was always seen as risk-free. And as we've seen over the last several years with a lot of different events, whether they're geopolitical events like we're discussing today with the, the tensions between China and Taiwan or just the trade tensions between the US and China or things like COVID, there are risks associated with these extended supply chains that maybe weren't, uh, weren't accounted for as, as to the magnitude that they should have been over time. Where else are semiconductors sourced in that smaller percentage? Uh, there's very lo various locations around the world. There is still some manufacturing here in the U.S. Korea is a major manufacturer. Japan is as well. China is, is a significant manufacturer. And there is some manufacturing in Europe. So that other 35% is spread around. But there's nobody else who's nearly as dominant. There's no you know, major second player on the scale of, of Taiwan. So this is a scenario that we might not have paid much attention to just several years ago, but we're paying a lot more attention to it as time goes on. And that is the possibility of China taking back Taiwan. What yeah. would happen to the global semiconductor supply chain if or when that happens? Well, there would be at a minimum massive disruption of that supply in the short term. The long term equation is a little harder to predict, I think. But if you think about it, chips are in almost everything we use that has an on-off switch. Um, I've seen articles or references where they say that a typical person in the States or Western Europe probably has several hundred encounters a day with, with devices that have chips. And that's, so it's, it's everything we make and it's, it's industries kind of across the board. So um, there isn't enough capacity anywhere else in the world to make up if that 65% were somehow shut down or interrupted. Um, so you'd have disruption in that supply, you'd have a ripple effect in the manufacturing of almost all goods and services, like I said, things that have an on-off switch. You'd also likely in a scenario like that have you know, ancillary disruption in the transportation networks in that part of the world, in the China Sea. So you talk about shipping and air freight would be disrupted by any kind of a conflict there that would impact other goods as well. Um, Long-term, it, it's a little harder to understand. Um, if those facilities were actually impacted directly, if they were damaged, I mean, it could take years to bring some of that capacity online. And depending on what the outcome of the conflict was, you know, there's, there's a lot of wild cards that would go into how that investment would take place. And then where even that supply would go. I mean, um, you could look at situations where if, if there were a situation like this and China were to somehow maintain soft or hard control of that manufacturing, maybe those who were looked upon as... Uh, as allies of Taiwan might have restricted access, even if the manufacturing wasn't disrupted. Yeah. Now, a wild card there is that China is also a big consumer of Taiwanese manufactured chips. So there's a little bit of self, uh, self damage they would be doing as well. Mm -hmm. in the situation well, like that. this situation hasn't exactly escaped anyone's notice. I mean, the no. passage of the Chips Act indicates the concern the United States has now on creating a domestic uh, chip uh, production base, right. but it doesn't sound like we're doing quite enough. If what ha if this happens, the scale, the impact it would have 
it, what we're doing now doesn't seem to be enough. Is that is that probably the case? Yeah, I think we're probably taking the right steps. I mean, I think there's there, it's and it's not just the Chips Act in the U.S. The the EU is doing things to try to encourage and incentivize production within the European Union, um, which theoretically would be a safer harbor for U.S. manufacturers as well, as is South Korea and Japan. They are doing things as well to incentivize and try to localize production. The issue is that these facilities don't just come online overnight, right? I mean, it takes a while to build a chip fabrication facility. The other issue, and at least this is my understanding of the CHIPS Act in the U.S., and I suspect it's likely true in some of the other countries that are that are doing these incentive programs as well. It's very much geared toward the latest generation chips, which is fantastically important from a national security perspective and from some of those very, very visible types of goods that are manufactured, defense production, um, high tech, you know, high, high value communications equipment, things of that nature. But when you talk about the production of all the other things, the, you know, that toaster oven, the coffee maker, those the kinds of facilities that build those chips are not necessarily included in those incentive programs. And those are those are old generation, not even second generation, but third and fourth generation chips and manufacturing that, that people aren't necessarily as interested in, in recreating that kind of capacity elsewhere. So mm -hmm. that's one issue. Um, the other issue is, is that, um, you know, it, like I said, it takes time to build those facilities and there are ancillary industries there are other industries that support chip making that have to also be present and have to be invested in and scaled up as well. Yeah. Short term, though, uh, as another thing the United States is doing is just trying to restrict China's access to certain high technology, including, as you say, some of the most sophisticated chips. Well, there still is that interrelationship between Taiwan and China. Even now, TSMC has operations in, on the mainland, correct? How do mm -hmm. we uh, might we see a risk of that? technology being transferred to China uh, just as a result of these close links that already exist between China and Taiwan? Oh, I think so. I, I think so. I mean, I, you have seen a bit of a pivot in the news and some of the um, most vocal figures in Taiwan and in the semiconductor industry that have in the past been much more open to collaboration with China and much more open to being open. They, there's been a bit of a pivot um, given the, the rise in tensions lately, but you're right. Yeah, that, 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 that technology would be at risk in, in many ways through mm -hmm. a situation like this. Okay, so what should companies be doing now to mitigate the risk of this occurrence? I think there's a couple of things they can do. They can be establishing relationships with other suppliers. Now, granted, um, you when 65% of production is in Taiwan, there's only so much that can be done. But if companies are sole sourcing from Taiwan now, it, you know, it's time for them to try to establish relationships with manufacturers that have facilities elsewhere to diversify that supply base. Um, the issue is that everybody else is probably trying to do the same thing and there's only so much capacity there. But that being said, if there is a conflict situation or something else that disrupts the supply, you're much more likely if you already have a relationship with someone else to be able to get at least some production from them than if you're going in cold at that point and trying to start anew with a, a new mm -hmm. supplier. The other thing I think that they can do is start rethinking their inventory strategies. It's it's a doesn't have as much long-term impact, but, but there are things that companies can do to try to build and hold more inventory than maybe they would traditionally be doing in these types of chipsets so that if there is a disruption, they can ride out the storm a little while longer than they would be able to do otherwise. Long term, do you think it's reasonable to expect the possibility of a significant domestic production base for semiconductors in the United States? I think it's, it's hard to predict that. I think that you will definitely see through the legislation incentives, you will see a migration of some of that capacity back, particularly those, those latest generation um, chipsets. The other stuff is much more problematic, the lower, lower generation stuff. Um, well, time will have to tell on that. Yeah. Well, it's going to be a very uncertain future, but certainly companies shouldn't just be sitting back and doing nothing at this point, given the risk of a severe disruption in the microprocessor or semiconductor supply chain. John Ferguson of TBM Consulting, thank you so much for enlightening us on what some of the situations are and what companies can actually do to mitigate that risk. Thanks a lot for being with me. Thank you, Bob.